big red button has been pressed. <laughs> Welcome, thank you everyone for coming. I would like to know how to RSVP for the seat in front that says RSVP. I'll take that seat. Um, my name is Ben Nellinson. I am a web developer at Agaric, a worker-owned cooperative that's been doing its thing since 2006, um, making websites. We haven't changed that. Um, and I'm going to present a case study on a project we worked on and are still working on called Find at Cambridge. Um, with the idea of um, looking at how to work iterative UX, so regular improvements into the user experience into your projects um, at each step of the way um, from the, uh, the research done ahead of time um, and then user testing and continued improvement and, and more and also the design process. Um, so, what's not included in this talk is any technical detail, um, much in the way of uh, project management tips. Um, there aren't going to be any efficiency epiphanies in how to run this, and no, no advice on obtaining budget to do the continuous improvement. Um, I'm available, you know, $250 an hour, personal consulting fee to tell you how to get budget. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> Ask for it, that's about it. Um, all right. All right. Um, so Find at Cambridge was born out of a collaborative discussions with diverse stakeholders, um, residents and, and representatives from the city and schools um, and community-based organizations. Um, and this, this feedback um, highlighted the need for Find at Cambridge to serve as an easy to use multilingual single point portal for parents of children in particular to find activities um, there. So there's sort of two problems at once that the people who came up with this project were dealing with. There were um, lots of programs being offered, lots of service providers from the government and from nonprofits and partnerships um, that were providing a lot of services. Um, and there were plenty of people with children that they wanted to get into after school programs and such things. But there was such a diversity of opportunity that there wasn't one place where someone could find that. Um, and you know, one of the biggest tricks on this project was getting a lot of these stakeholders on board. And I can only talk about a very small piece that uh, having a decent user experience played in uh, getting everybody on board. Um, but the, there was really big lifting to sort of um, coordinate with all of the, all the different service providers and, and, and get them interested in, in collaborating in one place. But you know, they had a problem people not knowing about their services, and um, parents of children had an issue of not being able to find the services. Um, so. The people who made this happen, who had the, the idea, um, and that brought it by Nancy Tauber, the executive director of the, um, the uh, kids' uh, Policy Council in Cambridge and Dr. Leo Bird, um, the sorry, I apparently did not coordinate the notes with the slides, but I will keep them coordinated. Um, and Dr. Leo Bird, the director of the Lemon Creative Learning Program at the MIT Media Lab, um, and they kicked off this project with a ton of research. Um, and research influences everything. In this case, my favorite anecdote is that it influenced the domain name of the site, um, the top level domain. So uh, from their surveys and their research, they learned that um, people trusted, you know, when they, they just put out like possible names for the site, including with the Find a Cambridge, with the .gov address and the .org address. And they found that uh, people expected more useful information from a .org 
than a .gov uh, domain name. I think that's probably changing in Massachusetts um, since the 2015 when the survey was done because um, mass.gov and boston.gov have relaunched both on Drupal um, and are fantastic sites and way more usable and I think that the general attitudes of what a .gov will give but um, that was my favorite piece of, of research and learning what people um, you know people trusted .org more than .gov uh, so first thing um, for research or any project is who is this for and the reason Find at Cambridge is doing what it's doing is number one for parents looking for activities for their children um, so that is when I'm talking about a generic user of the site and not specifying, I apologize for that, but this is who I'm talking about. This is the, the number one target audience. Um, this is also what would be the regular visitors to the site, people not logging in. Um, these are parents looking for activities for their ch children. Um, and then second audience is program managers or administrators of service providers. Um, the, the partner organizations who are responsible for keeping their site content and events up to date. Um, the, and then, um, then the third important audience is the site administrators, the people running the Find at Cambridge um, organization themselves. So the research methods that were used were comparative analysis of other sites. Um, students from the Harvard School of Public Health reached out to and talked to um, other sites in a semester-long project. Um, Code for Boston, and they talked to other like um, other other resource portals, portals, and then Code for Boston separately evaluated um, municipal event sites and provided an analysis to find a Cambridge. A uh, detailed set of user personas was created for the primary audience, parents of children, um, looking for events, programs, and services, and this was based on Cambridge's demographics. Um, and everything was designed with them in mind. Um, now, for the user testing that was done, and we'll talk about later, um, people were recruited from a cross-section of socioeconomic and languages spoken, again, um, with Cambridge's demographics in mind. Um, so Nancy interviewed more than 220 service providers in Cambridge in the area um, about their needs uh, before we even started working on the site. And then a survey of parents and their needs got 1,250 responses. Um, and that was actually a high response rate and was from putting a lot of effort into it. Um, and so uh, all going to the first big point. Um, which is to iterate on what someone else has built and some of the things that um, was learned in that process is, uh, well, that's, yeah, move to a second, but iterating on what it, someone else has built is more than just the research, it's also um, building on something like Drupal. Uh, how many of you have hit tab before you do anything else on a Drupal site and seen the skip to main content? So you're building on, just by building on Drupal, you make sure that people don't have to go through the 11 items before, um, it, you know, people at screen readers don't have to go through 11 menu items before they can get to the content of the site. Um, and this is, I mean, for me, part of iterative UX also uh, is, you know, building on Drupal or building on another established framework that has done the work on accessibility, you're not um, having to start over and do that yourself. Um, but from the comparative analysis, um, doing a look and feel and all of that, um, one of the key things learned was not to use automatic translation. Um, I can give an example from the Find at Cambridge site. This is how Google translates it. Um, and <laughs> they, this is Massachusetts. The one, the one word that like, it shouldn't have translated is, is mass, because that's referencing the state. 
Um, and somehow Google has decided that the one word it feels confident translating is mass, as like masses of people. Um, and it's, I have no idea what it's doing with like, like its email, it translated find it as, as Buscada. Um, and so this is actually one of the iterative improvements that we have to do. So I mean, the, the key thing is that you know, we made sure not to do an automatic translation and not tell anyone. Because that, like, that is sort of betrayal to people who speak other languages to see something that's clearly, like, it's to pretend it's for them and then it's not there. So there is automatic translation, but it's obvious that it's automatic translation. So when see, someone sees something that's, you know, ridiculous, they'll blame Google and not that. So one of the improvements going forward as budget allows is to combine automatic translation with um, with with manual translation with solid translation so that it can do both so like already like the about page is manually translated but the hundreds and hundreds of um, uh, events and programs and all of that uh, are not able to be automatically translated yet and we have not yet put together that really good integration so we can make sure that we translate all the menu items perfectly um, while still making clear when something else is machine translated or not. All right, so the design portion of the iteration. Um, and the key thing here is you get to iterate um, before you build. And I originally pitched this presentation in large part because it had felt like we'd made so many changes to the site over the years. Um, but in you know, reviewing the project and everything, it became clear how many decisions of crucial importance were made before you know, we configured a single content type. And so in addition to the research, we had the really great opportunity to um, work, you know, bring in the designer we normally work with, and, uh, and he did a great deal of design. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's sort of like we're standing on a couple sets of giants already. We're standing on Drupal and all of the work into accessibility and usability. It's already done. We're standing on the research. Um, and now we've got a um, designer to take us even farther. All right. This is Todd Linkner. took us through the design. Um, 297 messages are what he was CC'd on for finding Cambridge in 2015 alone um, that I also was involved in. Um, and the project didn't even start until May of that year. Um, but a ton of work before we had to do anything. Um, and he has, um, yeah, he's been refining the approach and it's, going to go into a lot of the ways that it's great for us, um, but um, he's essentially arguing for a more active role of the designer to be responsible for explicitly communicating the design system to both like the clients and end users and, and the developers. And releasing the developers from having to interpret a design and fill in the gaps. And so then, as we'll get into later, it'll let us as the developers focus on um, performance and, um, and the iterative improvements of other kinds um, and accessibility and polishing things on the admin side. So it starts with um, doing the content modeling and this is before it's touched any kind of CMS. Um, he likes to use Jekyll because it allows for structured data. This is a very structured data heavy site um, the point is to be able to filter it, um, you know, for age and activity and a million other things. And there needed to be a way to to give people a way to test this. Um, and he did that um, by building um, a real quick, um, you know, YAML code powered um, living wireframe. And to get content into that wireframe, um, there was two approaches taken initially. So it was first, um, we tried a Google Sheet 
we just put in all of the different data, but Google Sheet does not enforce uh, structured content, and so we got unstructured content. And that was not possible even in a, a flexible wireframe to, to make use of the data. Um, and they were also sort of, you know, at the same time iterating on what service providers are willing and able to provide. Um, so from the mass of what was provided in, a, in, in response to what basically because the tool didn't restrict what kind of answers be, were basically open answered questions, um, we created a, a more, you know, more locked down thing exactly like you would make in Drupal and so Todd liked contentful and we use that. Um, I've had good experience with gather content also or at least gather content has been good in giving refunds when uh, we stopped using them and they're like okay we'll refund it. But I mean gather content's a good tool, contentful is a good tool. Um, personally I think that you can spin up Drupal and configure the sites, uh, configure the content types and and fields and start bringing in content right away here and just as long as you're willing to throw it out later if you want. Um, it's almost as fast as doing it with Contentful or something like that. Um, but the point is that um, through some form, got structured data, um, Google, um, uh, the Google survey tool, Google Forms or whatever it's called, would do it also and it would allow you to get structured data into the spreadsheet, which is all that Todd wanted to do and once he got structured data in a spreadsheet, um, he was able to get it into a wireframe. Um, and, and the wireframe being driven by structured data sort of helped, um, like, it, it helped, you know, he's moving the whole thing towards as, so being their programmatic thinking, um, structured parametized system of components that are able to interact and have relationships with one another. So these are the events, these are the, the, um, the programs, um, and these are the, the, the services. And so he's got all of this in, um, in data form and he's plugging it, he's actually plugging into something that's much more than what you think of as a, a regular wireframe. So again, he's using Jekyll to power at this time, but pretty much any static site jet generator could do it. Um, or at least uh, Jekyll and Hugo, some of the more powerful ones can do it. Um, so Todd didn't concern himself with some of the more nuanced differences between a wireframe and prototype. Um, you know, anything that's too abstract, a wireframe or anything, or IA documents are not going to be easily understood. And so the point is to use the wireframe as um, an unpolished prototype for iterating on. Um, and so wireframe is, is sketching in code and content. Um, and so it's very different from what, you know, what is also ultimately produced. These, oh, sorry. Yes. Um, <coughs> so a wireframe is very different from what is also ultimately produced, um, which is these, you know, buttons and, and widgets and stuff, which is, which is great. And this is also part of a design system and that's how we can, you know, you know, make changes to the site without having to go back to the designer every time, um, the UX designer, the visual designer. Um, but it's um, the, the the wireframe as uh, as an iterative unpublished prototype is unpolished prototype is a as a whole other other thing. And so the whole point is that you are showing. Uh, not telling. Showing is more powerful than telling. Um, so clients are going to have their bias from previous websites, from their work, um, thinking that they um, have to translate everything into visual terms um, to talk to designers. So it's not just it's not just a picture. The showing is is a very you know visceral. The point is that it's it's there, the interaction is part of the showing. Um, and so ultimately, um, it, the, this is the, the, you know, it's, it's essentially built, um, you know, uh, an interactive site. Um, it just has none of the, the functionality as far as the data entry and everything, 
but it's a site powered by the data gathered separately and allowed full interaction and this was rapidly prototyped on a couple times. Um, quick note, just because if I don't run out of time, um, the interesting thing about um, the collections here is that this is something that tested pretty well with actual users, um, but was not something that the people running the site ultimately had the capacity to maintain. Um, and so this is something we actually had, to, this is something, you know, the co collections functionality is something that we did end up building and then taking away. Um, and so that's not the kind of iteration you necessarily want, but it is part of providing the experience in this case. Um, a sane experience for the site administrators of not having to um, you know, do a kind of content curation that they were not uh, set up for. So, handoff from design to development. Um, so we came in with this incredibly fortunate situation of all the research and all the design before we we came in, um, but still development compared to the design portion feels like this. Um, it's uh, it's a much slower going to, to build all the functionality than to um, just work on the interaction, um, but we had a good solid um, interaction to simply build it too. And what was really awesome about the work that went into um, the living prototype is that he then translated that directly into um, these seven letters, which is the way to do it, um, HTML and CSS. So we were taking um, you know, static HTML and CSS and translating it into Drupal, but we're not. Um, taking a picture of a mock-up. We were taking something that was proven to have worked for the interaction, not just as a, as a still picture, and, and building it. So, um, you know, the iteration had done, been done when it was easier to do HTML, CNS, CSS before there was a Drupal site there, and now we had stuff that we knew would, would work. So we, that, you know, the iteration is gonna continue as I'm gonna talk about, but that fast iteration for the um, for refining how how the user interface really worked was done with pure HTML and CSS essentially with a simple static site generator, um, and so that was refined before we got it into Drupal. All right. So, giving the um, the um, you know, so this is something else that you know changed after we built it. Um, another iteration after the the initial launch, um, and so you know, Todd emphasizes sharing the uh, the the underlying data model with the, the client, um, but ultimately decided that we would not be sharing the underlying data model with everybody. And so here the, the data model is that um, like grades and ages are being tracked separately because you have some programs that think only in ages and you have other programs that think only in grades. And so it was really important for the service providers to be able to say like here is my eligibility eligibility criteria and it is, you know, I, we only serve people in grades five and six and someone else is, um, you know, only serving age, you know, 10. Um, but what we ultimately did was simplify that um, on the site as it is now to simply show ages. Um, research with parents showed that they were more comfortable thinking about the age of their child than the grade. Um, and there was less confusion about summer activities and things that are between grades. Um, but again, every program has their own age and grade eligibility criteria. Um, and something maybe eight-year-olds to 12 years old 
So it would, that would show up in both the ages 5 to 10 and the ages 11 to 13 categories here. And the work of making age work as well as grade is essentially put on the various service providers. And this is only possible because Cambridge has a full-time staff person that find it, sort of helping the service providers. And, um, and it possibly, as we're talking to other cities about this, um, you know, having an automatic fuzzy um, age to grade mapping is, is probably going to come back. It's something we explored, um, but ultimately it was, um, it was considered more valuable for the service providers to, to you know, just fill in that extra mapping, even though they didn't think of serving a grade or an age, depending on which service provider it was. Um, the Find at Cambridge was able to help them. So it's sort of like exposing this data model to the, um, to, uh, exposing the data model to the service providers and to the administrators, but not to um, visitors. So visitors can still, you can still filter by, um, by grade, but it, that's not what's put on the front page anymore. All right, but we, didn't, we did not forget about our service providers. Um, so um, for them, instead of the user profile page, the default for Drupal and not very useful, um, one change that was made pretty quickly um, was to give a customized dashboard so they could see key actions um, that they can take and if there's any co alerts on their content. Um, and then if you've ever thrown something away or deleted something and think immediately made a huge mistake um, and want to dive into that garbage chute and get it back or digital equivalent and stop that thing from being lost forever somehow, um, we did get people who uh, experienced that and had that fear. Um, and so another improvement was to add the ability to recover a deleted node. Um, this is using the kill file module um, in Drupal 8, there's the trash module. Um, but it's just a really critical user experience thing for these um, service providers who would sometimes clean up old programs um, or do a duplicate and, and then delete it. Um, but we're desperately afraid of losing like, you know, a thousand fields practically worth of, uh, of information. So this is discontinuous improvement. Um, Kaizen translates continuous improvement, might be overselling a little bit. Um, first thing, meet expectations. Uh, most of the regular improvements fall under the category of meeting expectations. Uh, so empower users toward not finding organizations with terms they specified um, in the title, even because it was in the organization, um, we started, even though it's like you think if that was really an important term for a program, it would be in the program or in the organization or vice versa, we did make it so that organizations were sort of grouped with programs for search and vice versa so that um, they would both come up if either one of them had some of the keywords included. Um, and go where users are. Um, in our case, use testing in a computer lab in a library was actually the one of the most realistic um, places to go out and meet people, which was fantastic. Um, but unfortunately, our users in that computer lab were on Internet Explorer 11, um, and so immediately, um, you know, found that extra tweaky bugs that were there. All right, um, one design decision. In Cambridge, no one knows what the neighborhoods are called because they are called things like Area 2 and Neighborhood 9 um, and Mid-Cambridge, um, and the port is a brand new one. So anyhow, the, no one knows what the neighborhoods are, so the map was how we did the filtering um, by, by neighborhood for programs. Uh, that implied pretty crazy stuff on the back end, but I said no technical details, so don't get that. Um, out of date information about events and programs will drive people away. Um, so we added the big um, report as outdated or inaccurate um, functionality, and a link there for people to do that and let people know when something is no longer, no longer um, valid. And that has actually helped a huge amount. Um, 
final quick cool. ideas. Um, performance is part of the user experience, and iterative improvements are in performance are as much a part of you know iterating on the user experience as anything else. Um, and we did some uh, improvements to um, how fast the content loads. Um, this one in particular. Um, always keep user testing an integral part of the user um, process. Um, so listen, learn, and loop. Um, I guess, you know, no matter how awesome your clients are, and our clients are awesome, um, they're, they're going to have ideas, and those ideas need to be run um, past users before you go and build them. So improving results. Um, but yeah, I think I'm. I just went over time. So um, I will. Yeah, and just one other. The you know, later improvements. We learned that uh, there's a lot of water parks in Cambridge, and they came up all the time. Um, because there were just so many of them, uh, and so it was just like it was it was it was it, part of getting relevant results was um, figuring out how to how to reduce this. Um, so I mean, it's all kinds of things you could do, like only show them in the summer and stuff like that. But in this case, it was um, just a sort of a simple matter of uh, like removing the the age because water parks are all ages. And so people would say, I'm going to look for an activity for, you know, three to five-year-olds, and like three water parks would be at the top of the list because they'd be whatever that's what's closest to them, and that just wasn't a relevant result. So we removed the as a quick hack, we removed the ages from water parks so that if people searched for water parks explicitly, they would find them, um, but that they wouldn't um, just get only water park results when they're really looking for a more specific age range, um, and uh, and that and then. You know, and then putting water parks just as a featured thing in the summer, so it's not like people wouldn't know about them, but that they wouldn't be cluttering results. Um, and so, you know, that's from you know doing more user testing and doing more um, um, yeah, and doing more. Uh, and, and, and doing more, you know, looking at the analytics, seeing what goes up. So I'll just, you know, conclude with, uh, you know, there's no matter how exhaustive your planning and prototyping are, things will change. And a couple of inspirational quotations um, to leave you with that. Um, so interview X is maybe the positive way of looking at the fact that no plan survives contact with the enemy. Um, but you know, don't don't think of your users as the enemy any more than you think of yourself as the enemy, because. We are the enemy too. Thank you.